All right, well, welcome back to the Pastor's Bible Study. As we're continuing to look at some of the core doctrines of the Christian faith, and it's based on that book, you remember, I mentioned several weeks ago, 20 Things That Every Christian Ought to Know. And so we're looking at some of the basic core doctrines of Christian belief. The last several weeks, we've been looking at what God is like, and we're going to finish up that discussion today. A friend of our daughter's is a youth minister at her church, and she publishes a, a weekly video blog, a vlog, that she calls Coffee and Bible with Tiffany. And I thought, you know what? That's brilliant. Those are two of my favorite things coffee, and the Bible. So that's what we're going to do today. I've got my coffee, and I've got my Bible, and I hope that you have yours as well, as we're going to spend some time today as well, bouncing around and digging through the Word of God as we finish up this discussion on what God is like. Now, we have spent, by the time we're done today, we'll have spent three sessions talking about what God is like. And I want you to know we are just scratching the surface of what he's like. We talked in the very first lesson about what God is like, that he is knowable, but not entirely. God is not like some science experiment that we can bring into a lab and stick under a microscope and, and really examine him. God's not like that. God's much bigger than that. So much bigger that our human finite minds can simply not comprehend everything there is to know about God. And you remember we talked about that in the first lesson when we were talking about what God is like, that he's not completely knowable. But, however, he is sufficiently knowable. We can't know everything there is to know about God, but we can know everything we need to know about God. And we started the first two lessons. We, we Remember I said that these attributes of God can be put in sort of two buckets. There's things that show us the greatness of God. Those things that are just gigantic and they're awe-inspiring. Things like God's omniscience. He knows everything. Not just everything that is happening right now in your life, but everything that is happening right now in the lives of all 7 billion people on this planet. Plus, every possible thing that could happen to all 7 billion people on this planet. And he's known that for every single person who's ever walked on this planet and every single person who ever will. God knows everything. That's great, gigantic, awe-inspiring. God's omnipresence. That everywhere, he's everywhere at the same time. And his omnipotence, he's completely all-powerful. Those are things that are gigantic and awesome and just absolutely awe-inspiring. God is great. Now today, I want to end our discussion anyway about what God is like, thinking about things in the other bucket. There's the bucket of God is great, but the other bucket that God is good. And I want us to spend our time today talking about those attributes about the goodness of God. Okay, so let me open up our time in a word of prayer, and then we're going to open up the word of God and see what it has to say about the goodness of God. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to open up your word that you, though you didn't owe it to us, you revealed yourself to us. That we can learn about your greatness, we can learn about these amazing characteristics of you, but then we can also learn about your goodness. And so, Father, I pray as we do that, as we look at some of the aspects and attributes of your goodness, would you speak to us today? And as your Spirit does what he does and guides us into all truth and teaches us all things, Lord, would you help us to be responsive? We can't even begin to learn about you without a touch from you. And we know you're going to be faithful to your peace. Now help us to be faithful to ours. 
Would you bless these next few moments we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me open up my notes here. We look back in the Old Testament book of Job, and do you remember the story of Job? Job chapter 36 and verse 26. Now this is Elihu, a friend of Job's, and you remember that not everything that Job's friends told him was absolutely true, but this is what his friend said. He said, God is great, and we do not know him. Now, as we just talked about, that is partially true, not entirely true. And I want us to look at some more things that we do know about God, specifically focusing today on the things about the goodness of God. First of all, God is good. That's one of the things the Bible just comes out and tells us, that God is good. Now, that's very different from his greatness, and it's an, it's an important distinction that we make. God is not only great, but God is a good God. The gods of the ancient Near East, that was the culture of, of the biblical times, the biblical era, the ancient Near East. And the gods of the, the Greek culture and the gods of the Roman culture, those gods were great in the sense that they were said to be above humanity, supernatural. Remember, we talked about what that word means, above nature. And the gods of the Greeks and the gods of the Romans, they looked at them that way. They said they were above humanity. They were supernatural. They had powers that were beyond human reach. They were immortal. And so in that sense, if God was only great, if the God of the Bible was only a great God, we might say, well, he's not tremendously different than any of the other little g gods who people have thought of or taught about. But the God of the Bible is not only those things above humanity, supernatural, powers beyond our reach, immortal. The gods of the Greeks and the gods of the Romans were not good gods. They were basically people that had superpowers. They were kind of like superheroes, but they were super enemies, super villains. They were not good. They were self-centered. They were petty and lazy and dishonest and lusty and greedy. You read those stories of Greek and Roman mythology, and those gods were not good. See, that's a very big distinction between the gods, little g gods, that mankind has made up. Because those little g gods are basically just us with some bigger powers. But the God of the Bible is very different. The Bible says specifically God is good. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 31. Thirty-first Psalm. I told you I'm not going to pre-mark my verses so that we can turn there together. That gives you time to turn there as well. So you can read these verses for yourself. Psalm 31, verse 19. This is what the psalmist said. How great is your goodness. And we talk about some of the great things about God and his greatness. And here he says, your goodness is great. And then flip over to Psalm 34, verse 8. And he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is a good, good God. And that's one of the things that the Bible says about us. And then we move, we move into the New Testament. Luke chapter 18. Verse 19. This is, this is the story of when the, the rich young ruler comes and asks Jesus. He says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And the ruler comes to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says back, this is Luke 18, verse 19. 
Jesus says back, Why do you call me good? There is no one good except God alone. Listen, the, the Bible says that God is a good God that's very different than his greatness. And because he's good, that is, that is a, a, an aspect, an attribute of every single thing that he does. I know sometimes God works in our lives in a way that is not in accordance with what we want. We ask God for something, we come to him in prayer, we ask him to do something, but his answer is no. And sometimes we're tempted to say, is God really good? I wanted this and he said no. Why would a good God say no? Sometimes God brings discipline in our lives. And when that happens, we're, we're, question, we're, we're tempted to question, is God good because he brought this discipline into my life? But listen to what the Hebrew writer said. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting there in verse 6. He said, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which you have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, if, if you didn't have the discipline of God in your life, then you need to question, am I really a child of God? Therefore, we had, furthermore, we had earthly fathers, verse 9, who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we much rather be subject to the, to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Listen, even God's discipline is driven by his goodness. Everything that God does, he's in your corner. He's on your side. One of the attributes of God is that he is just good. Then some of the characteristics of his goodness. One of the, the aspects or the characteristics of God's goodness is that God is love. You know, we read through the scripture and it talks about some of the characteristics of God. That God is merciful that he is gracious and righteous and full of compassion. And every one of those things is absolutely true. And those are qualities that he has. But when it speaks of his love, it says it just a little bit differently. It doesn't say he is loving. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 it doesn't say that, that God is loving. Listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. See, it's an essential part of his being. The fact that God is love, it's part of his character, part of his nature. And so it has, in every way, it's like him. His love knows no end. It knows no limits. There's no place his love cannot go. And it reflects his essence. We talked last time about some of the aspects of the greatness of God, the self-existence of God, the supernatural aspect of him, the fact that he is eternal. Because God is eternal love. His love reflects all of those things. It's self-existent. It's supernatural. It's eternal. And where God is concerned, love is more than just an emotion, just words. Love is expressed in action. Love is acted out where God is concerned. There is that maybe most famous of verses at least among church circles anyway, John 3.16. Open up there to the New Testament Gospel of John 3.16. While you're turning there, I'm going to sneak a little more coffee. First 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And the word gave there in John 3.16, it means to give something as a gift. And see, for God, it wasn't enough for him to stand in heaven and say, I love people, I love humans, I love those things that I have created, those people I have created. His love drove him to action. It's expressed in action. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, I don't need to read this one. I think it's part of the Romans road that I think we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But I'm going to read it and I encourage you to do it as well. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were most unloving, when we were most unlovable, when we had no time, no inclination, no concern for God, he demonstrated his love for us by sending Christ. Now that is love. Love permeates every aspect of God's being. And listen, because you and I were created in his image, and then if you're a believer in Christ, you were recreated. You're a new creature in Christ, recreated with his spirit in you. You and I have the ability and the responsibility to show his love to others. We are now the, the agents of it, the mouthpiece of it in this world. Matthew chapter 22. This is sometimes called the Great Commandment. We talk over in Matthew chapter 28 about the Great Commission, go into all the nations and make disciples. This is the Great Commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Because you and I are created in God's image and recreated if we are creatures in Christ, recreated, new creatures in Him, we have that responsibility and the ability to show His love to others. Part of the goodness of God. He is good. That's what the Scripture tells us. His goodness is shown in His love. His, one of the other as, aspects of God's goodness is His truthfulness. God is always truthful. Jesus said in John 17, 17, he said that the word of God is truth. And so if his word is the measure of truth, then God is by definition truthful. And this is what it says in Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 23, in the Old Testament, Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, God does not ever lie. And then Paul takes it just one little step forward, one step beyond that in what he tells us about God over in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is writing to Titus, and he says there in verse 2, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. In the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 23, it says that God does not lie, and Paul adds this little aspect to it to say that God cannot lie. Sometimes the question is asked, is there anything that God cannot do? Well, there was just something that Paul said. The Bible says that God cannot do. God cannot lie. In fact, God cannot do anything that is against his character, that is contrary to his nature. These things we're talking about, his goodness, his love, we'll talk about his holiness and his righteousness, his truthfulness, God cannot do anything that is against his character, that is contrary to his nature. Now I want you to think for just a minute about how the truthfulness of God affects your faith in him. 
Because when you understand and accept and, and really cling on to the idea that God not only does not lie, but he cannot lie, then, then you know something about this word. Every single thing that God said in here is true. Every single promise that he ever made will come true, will be played out. He cannot lie. He does not lie. And listen, that has a profound impact on our faith. That we know absolutely that we can trust in him. When Satan whispers in our ear and he says, you know what, I don't think God's going to come through this time. I think he's, he's forgotten about you. I think he's not going to keep his promise. The one time in all of eternity that God's going to let someone down, it's going to be right now in your life. And then we remember, God does not lie. God cannot lie. And if God said it, that settles it. So we look at God's goodness. God is good, the Bible says. God is love. God is truthful. One of the other aspects or attributes of God's goodness is that God is holy. Now that's a great church word there, right? And we, we hear it a lot, we use it a lot in church that God is holy. The Hebrew word for holiness, it has two basic meanings. One of the meanings of that word is it means absolutely pure. And so we talk about God's holiness. He's morally perfect or pure. That's one of the aspects that means that God is holy. He is completely untouched, completely unstained by evil. Now that's very different than you and I, right? That's very different than mankind in that we are, we are sometimes completely touched and stained by the evil in this world. But God is separated from it. God is completely, absolutely pure. Listen to what the Old Testament prof prophet Habakkuk had to say. Now I realize that's not a book that maybe you have read before, and you may think I'm making that book up. That <laughs> Habakkuk, that's not in the Bible. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Find Matthew in the New Testament, and then just start turning backwards very slowly into the Old Testament. The last books of the Old Testament are the minor prophets. And you start flipping back through those minor prophets, and it doesn't take very long until you come to the short little book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. This is what the prophet has to say. He's talking about God here. And he says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. See, God is completely untouched, completely unstained by evil. And the entire law, the entire moral code of God reflects this aspect of his holiness. Sometimes you'll hear people and you'll talk to them about the Ten Commandments, right? That's God's the basics of God's moral code. You talk to them about the Ten Commandments and they'll say, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good person. I tell the truth most of the time, and I, I don't covet all of the time, and I've not broken all of the commandments. But when you read the Ten Commandments, you realize there is an absolute purity that God demands from us. Thou shalt not lie, period, right? Not thou shalt not lie, well, most of the time. Thou shalt not covet, Period. Not, well, do your best and try not to covet. See, God is absolutely pure. His moral code reflects that aspect of his absolute purity. It's what he demands from us as well. That if we're going to have a relationship with him, if we're going to come into any kind of fellowship with him, we have to come from that standpoint. And boy, that really creates a big problem for mankind. God is holy, and one of the things that word means is he's absolutely pure. The other thing it means is he is marked off, set apart from common use. We talked about this in, we, we were talking about the greatness of God, that he is separate from all of creation. And that's part of the aspect of his holiness. He's not part of creation. He's not like you and me. We're created in his image. We have some characteristics and attributes like God, 
But we're not like him. He's not like us. He's separate from all of creation. And a lot of times that sacredness of God is conveyed in objects or places that are associated with him. In our Bible reading plan in version, we're reading through the Old Testament. We just finished up Exodus. We just started into the book of Numbers. And there in Exodus, you remember when, when God called Moses up and he was going to give Moses the Ten Commandments. And God said to the children of Israel, he said, he said to Moses, tell them they can't come near the mountain. They can't come up on the mountain while this is happening. Because that part, right, at that point, the, the, whole, the presence of God was there that was marked off, separate, as holy. And as God's children, we are called to be holy. Now, this holiness is one of those already but not yet qualities in the life of the believer. On the one hand, when, when you come to a relationship with Christ, if you're watching this video today and you know there was a point in time in your life when you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus for your salvation, you are a child of God. And if you're watching this, you are already holy. Now, if that doesn't apply to you and you can't point back to that time, you're not certain about your eternity. When I die, I don't know if I'll go to heaven or not. I want you to stay on to the end of the video because I'd like to talk for a minute to you specifically. But as, as a child of God, on the one hand, we are already holy. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. They're back into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's what Paul had to say. He said, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now remember, he's writing to the church in Corinth. He's writing to believers. In verse 17, If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Listen to this. For the temple of God is holy, and that's what you are. As believers in Christ, on the one hand, we are already holy. God said through the prophet Isaiah that though our sins were as scarlet, we shall be washed white as snow. And Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he said, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When you come to a relationship with Christ, you are already holy. But on the other hand, we're commanded to be holy. Jump back to Matthew chapter 5. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Jesus said this. He said, Therefore be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So on the one hand, we are holy in Christ. On the other hand, we're called to be holy. If you were in our service yesterday, we talked a little bit about that. How as, as believers we have this, this constant pursuit of holiness. This, this holy discontent, if you will, for where we are in our pursuit of holiness. We never arrive. We're never fully there and we should never view it that way. If you missed the service yesterday, jump on our YouTube channel. Check it out there. I mean, that's where you found this video. So while you're out there, check out yesterday's service. Because as the, as the family of God, as people of God, he has made us holy, but He calls us to continually be in that pursuit of holiness. In some sense, some have called holiness God's most important attribute. And I think it's absolutely one of the most prominent. Because when, when we measure our holiness, not against our own standard or against other human beings, Right When you talk to folks about their relationship, what they, what they think it means or what, it, what they think it takes for someone to go to heaven, they very often say something like, well, I just believe you have to be a good person. And you know, my question to those people is always this, good by whose standard? 
I mean, I need to know that, right? If the standard to get into heaven is to be a good person, then I need to know what the standard is. By whose standard of goodness am I judging myself? If it's my own standard, well, I'm always going to make sure that I'm in. I'm going to adjust the standard always so that I make it. Or sometimes we'll look at other people and we'll say, well, I've, I've never committed murder. I've never cheated on my wife, so I'm better than some other people. Kind of a funny story. A friend of ours was pastoring a church. He just recently retired from pastoral ministry. And when his children were in school, his middle son, Matt, came home one day with a D on a math test. And so David, that's the pastor, he asked his son Matt, he said, Matt, what's the story with the D on the test? And Matt said, well, you know, Dad, it's really not that bad. You know, there was a kid in the class that got an F. And so David said to him, so that's your standard? The worst student in class, and as long as you're better than him, then you're okay? Which, and that's often what we do. We say, I'm better than other people, so therefore I'm okay. But, but the reality is that we're not going to be measured against our own standard when we stand before God. We're not going to be measured against the standard of other people. We're going to be measured against God's standard of perfect, God's standard of good enough, against God's standard of holiness. And when we realize that, we come to the unmistakable truth that we are in absolute need of a complete change morally and spiritually if we are going, going to have any hope of spending eternity with God. God is holy. He is good and He is love. He is holy. He is truthful. God is righteous. And I know today sometimes that word is kind of thrown around and it means great or awesome or or just something that's really impressive man that is absolutely righteous but when it applies to god that's not really what it means I mean, god is great and god is awesome and god is all of those things but when it applies to god righteousness means that god will always do what is right and his righteousness is essential and it really is his holiness applied to his interactions with us, his relationships with, with his creation, his relationships with other beings. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, continuing there in the Sermon on the Mount. You probably have heard this verse before. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And righteous Righteousness, God's righteousness is one of those things. It, it's talked about all throughout the pages of Scripture, that God is righteous. He will always do what is right. That means that everything that God does will always be in accordance with His law, always be in accordance with His character. God is just. He's not only good and truthful and holy, and love, he is righteous, he is just. You know, sometimes you talk to folks about who God is, and they'll say something like, you know, I just can't believe that God would allow anyone to go to hell. Because God is love, and God is mercy, and God is grace. And he is. He is every one of those things, and perfect in all of those characteristics. But if God is to be God, then he has to be perfect in all of his ways, not just the ways that we feel good and warm and fuzzy about. His love, his mercy and justice, or his love and mercy and grace, yes, absolutely. But God is also perfect in justice. That means that God... God's justice demands that he treat people as they deserve. Man, we think about, we talked about God's holiness just a moment ago. We said his standard is absolute purity. And that's the standard that we're going to get measured against. And God's justice demands that. 
that he treats people as we deserve. Now listen, that applies to punishment. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Again, this is another one of those verses on the Romans road that we talked about a couple weeks ago that we don't need to read, right? Because we're memorizing the Romans road, but, but I want you to read it. The first part of that verse, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Listen, that's necessary. God's justice demands that sin that mankind has be punished. And the only right and appropriate punishment for the sin against a holy God is death. His justice applies to that. His justice also applies to rewards, though. I mean, God wouldn't be a completely just God if his justice only applied to, to punishment. It also applies to reward. Hebrews chapter 11. I went past it there as I was talking. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. The Hebrew writer says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. See, God's justice applies to punishment. It also applies to rewards. And sometimes, though, as we look around, it can seem to us that God's justice is not at work. Maybe you've seen situations or you read about them where wicked, the wicked prosper, but believers don't. And, and in those times, we may be tempted to say, well, I don't know that I see God's justice. I don't know that God's justice is at work. But we have to be careful in those moments. Not evaluate God's justice based on a short-term basis, just what we see in this life. But realize that, that God's justice looks different than ours sometimes. God's justice will apply to each of us for the things that we have done in this life. He will be just. He will act justly. Now, as I mentioned, unbelievers sometimes struggle with the concept of a just God because they, they look at a God of love and they look at a good God and they say, how could that God allow someone to go to hell? But because God is perfect, as we talked about, so are his righteousness and his justice. God must do what is always right. He must do what is always just. And the justice of God demands death as the punishment for sin. But the grace of God, the love of God, compelled him to take it in our place. We look at some of these aspects of the goodness of God. He is love. He is good. He is truthful. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. The last thing I want us to talk about, I don't want to say very quickly because this is a big thing, that God is unchanging. Now, this is both an attribute of his goodness and his greatness. It falls really in both buckets, but God doesn't change. There is not a quantitative change to God. In other words, his attributes, his, his characteristics, he's not getting more of them, or he's not getting less of them. God is entirely holy, entirely perfectly just and righteousness and, and righteous and loving and gracious. He can't increase in any of those things. He doesn't ever decrease in any of those things. Acts chapter 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 17, verse 25. talking about God here and he says nor is he served by human hands as though we needed anything for he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things see God needs nothing God is not lacking in anything 
So he does not increase, he does not decrease. There's never a quantitative change in God. There's never a qualitative change. His qualities and his attributes remain the same for all of eternity. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God doesn't ever change. His qualities are consistent, always absolutely the same. Listen, those are things we can count on. And this is a part of His goodness as much of His greatness because there we will never come to a place where God's love will de decrease, where His goodness will decrease where his truthfulness will decrease or his holiness will decrease, his faithfulness, those things will never decrease. They're always the same eternally. So we think about the, the goodness of God. There are a lot of attributes that, that we come to as far as what the Bible tells us about God's goodness. And, and as I said at the beginning of this lesson, these three lessons that we're talking about what God is like, we are very much just scratching the surface of who God is. But we talked a lot about his greatness and those characteristics of God that are huge and gigantic and awe-inspiring. And then we saw a good number of scriptures that talk about the, the attributes and the aspects of God that are good his love and his justice and his righteousness and his his truthfulness the god that we serve is a good god he is a great god and he loves you and me i mentioned earlier that if you're watching this video today and you don't know that you have a relationship with christ you don't know if you were to die right now whether you would go to heaven and spend eternity with god or whether you would spend eternity in hell ever separated from him. And here's what I want you to know. Though the wages of sin is death, we read the first part of Romans 6.23. I want to read you the good news. Because the first part of that verse is not good news. Every one of us comes into this world as a sinner. And every one of us has that sin within our hearts. And that's the punishment. God's justice demands it. The wages of sin is death. But here's the good news, the second half of that. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, God loved you and I enough that he provided a way for the wages of sin, which is death, to be paid, but in a way that wouldn't result in you and I spending eternity separated from him. I can't pay the penalty for you because I owe it for me. You can't pay it for me because you owe it yourself. But if either of us, we pay it for ourselves, then we will spend eternity in a spiritual death separated from God forever. But God provided a way for his justice to be satisfied, but a way he could show us his grace and mercy and love. And that way was his son, Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross. He didn't owe the wages of sin, which is death, because he never sinned. But he died on a cross to pay the death penalty for you and for me. And all we need to do to experience his forgiveness and be able to be united with God for all of eternity is to repent of our sins. That really means to turn from them and turn to Jesus. And turn to him and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I can do nothing about it. But I believe that your death on the cross was sufficient for me to pay the penalty for my sins. And I, and I ask you, I need you to save me, Jesus. You know, it really is that simple. If you come to God in, in that kind of prayer, it's not the words that are magical. God knows whether you need them. And if you come to God in that kind of prayer, he'll hear that. The Bible says if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. And we just looked at the fact that God cannot lie. He will not lie. That is one prayer he will always answer. And so I encourage you today, 
that if you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, to do that, don't put it off. None of us know how much longer we have on this earth. Do that today and experience all of this goodness, all of this greatness that we just talked about, about God. You can experience that for real in your life with Him as your Heavenly Father. And then one day you'll spend eternity with Him and experience it for all of eternity. Well, thank you for joining me today for a little bit of coffee and a little bit of Bible as we wrapped up our discussion about who, what God is like, the goodness and the greatness of God. If you have questions, as, as every week I want to end it this way, if you have questions, if there's something we, we talked about that you want me to expand on, something I didn't talk about that you would like me to address, either post it in the, the Facebook post where you found the link to this Bible study, or send me a Facebook message or a WhatsApp, and I will put the question on Facebook as well as the answer so that everybody can see both of those together. I hope you have a, a great day today. I hope you have a great week. Let me close our time in prayer. Father, we thank you once again that we can come to your word, that we can be challenged by it, Lord, that we can come to know who you are through it. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself to us. We know you didn't owe that to us. Thank you for sending your son for us. We absolutely didn't deserve that. And Father, we just pray as we think about your greatness and we think about your goodness and all of these attributes that you have, Lord, we absolutely just, just ask you to help us to remember those when we start to doubt, to remember who you are when we start to question, when we don't know what's happening, when things aren't going our way, when you're not acting the way we want you to. Lord, help us to remember who you are, that you're a good, loving, just, holy Father. And Father, help us help that to be those to be the things that, that guide and govern our thoughts and our attitudes and our reactions towards you. Lord, would you bless everyone who's watching this video today? Bless us the rest of this week, Lord, that we might find ourselves in positions to be able to tell people about your goodness and give us the boldness and the courage to do it. And we thank you for meeting here with us today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.